Hello, Peter. Financial Times publication. I read in this paper that the Home Office made a decision to take away asylum status from Mukhtar Ablyazov, which it gave to him in 2011. Did we understand correctly that it's not really a decision yet, but it's like an intention of Home Office? That's correct. It's uh, a notification of intention that Mr. Abiyazov received. He received it in January. And when a country wants to take asylum protection away, the person who was protected by asylum protection has the right to oppose it. So right now he is still a refugee. He still has asylum protection. But it is true that the Home Office has notified their intention to take it away. What are the reasons why suddenly Home Office had such, uh, not a decision, but intentions? Well, it's very interesting. Your question is exactly the right question, because uh, they do not have any legal reasons to revoke his asylum status. And not only do they not have any legal basis to do it, but the procedure also that they have followed is completely unlawful. So you have both uh, no legal basis and even the procedures that they followed have uh, have been in violation of international and of the laws of the United Kingdom. So it's uh, uh, this is why the Financial Times, as you see, put this story into the context, which I think explains what is happening. Uh, and that is that David Cameron visited Kazakhstan last year. David Cameron signed some 700 million pounds worth of contracts with Kazakhstan. And David Cameron said that there are 85 billion pounds, so more than a hundred billion dollars worth of contracts that the United Kingdom can sign in coming years. And we have reason to believe, as you can understand reading the Financial Times, that this is a very large part of the reason why the Home Office now is moving to uh, try to take away the asylum status that was granted to Mr. Abiyazov. So you are considering it as a political decision or it's based on economics or business or lobbying activity? Well, definitely lobbying activity. We have received from a source inside the Kazakh government who was very shocked with what was going on. We have received extensive documentation that shows that there was illegal communication between representatives of Kazakhstan and Kazakh officials and British officials. And it is illegal for British official, officials, once asylum status has been granted to someone, it is illegal for them to even talk to the country about that person's status. So, uh, you know, since January, we were asking for details, for an explanation, and they were not giving us an explanation. And the Financial Times obtained these documents, and I think this explains very well. It's a combination of what you, uh, of what you said, very strong lobbying by Kazakhstan directly and indirectly. Uh, you know, as you see, the Financial Times says that David Cameron uh, saw the continuance of Mr. Obviazo's asylum status as a barrier to improved relations between the United Kingdom and Kazakhstan. So money plays a role, politics plays a role. And that's exactly what should not be happening in a situation where somebody is at risk. Are there any other precedents like that uh, in history of uh, law? We have been looking for precedents, and this is absolutely unprecedented. And, uh, you know, for the, for the Financial Times to put an entire page about this, this has created an enormous scandal in the United Kingdom because they pride themselves for being a law-based state and we cannot find any example uh, ever of a case where a country who has a political opponent like Mukhtar Abliazov is, has been able to successfully lobby uh, and pressure the authorities of the country, in this case the United Kingdom, to revoke status. It's just unprecedented.
So we understand that this intention are quite real, I mean the intention of home office, but do you have any idea what's really going on inside home office and these intentions? Well, we hope to find out because some of the documents that we've received are documents that we know that the Home Office has, and under the laws of uh, the United Kingdom, they must give those documents to Mr. Obyazov. They cannot make a decision and not explain their decision. So uh, they've essentially been caught. They've been caught not revealing the truth, and now we're going to go to court and we're going to force the Home Office to explain themselves. Are you going to invite some uh, people who could testify on behalf of Mr. Abliazov, like it was uh, back in times when Home Office made the previous decision to um, give this asylum status to Mr. Abliazov? Um, right now, at this stage, it's not a question of establishing the bona fide of Mr. Abliazov as someone who deserves refugee status. The initial stage in any court proceeding will be to show that what has happened, the way that the Home Office has made the decision and the basis on which they made the decision, both are completely illegal. And so this is a question of, uh, of uh, the laws of the United Kingdom. So that's the first step. What a court could do at the end of this process is rule that the decision of the Home Office to revoke his status was unlawful. And at that point, if his status was revoked by that point, the court can order his status to be reinstated. So, and uh, how this decision, uh, from your point of view, could influence uh, the procedures which are taking place right now in France? How this can uh, well, with the connection? Mm -hmm. It can operate in two different ways. Uh, on one hand, the court in France will be very concerned about sending Mr. Abliazov to Russia or Ukraine if he is no longer protected from onward extradition to Kazakhstan. Because part of their reasoning, I mean, I think that you're aware that the Cassation Court in France, the highest court in France, canceled the decision of the lower court in January to uh, allow his extradition. But in the reasoning of the lower court, they said that it would be fine to send Mr. Abdiazov to Russia or Ukraine, because since he is a refugee, he cannot be extradited onwards from Russia or Ukraine to Kazakhstan. Now the calculation is different, because they can no longer say a court, the new court, which is going to rehear the case, can no longer say he's protected from onward extradition. So that argument is no longer going to be there as a way of allowing him to be extradited. On the other hand, the court, and this is the second factor, the court now is going to have to assess what is the situation in Kazakhstan and what will happen to him in Kazakhstan, because now there is no argument that he will be extradited onwards from Russia or Ukraine to Kazakhstan after he arrives in, uh, in Russia or Ukraine. So it really complicates things for the court in France. Um, it makes it extremely complicated because during the proceedings, he may or may not be a refugee, and the court will have no guarantees if when their deliberations are finished, he will or will not be a refugee, because the refugee status is going to depend on something completely independent, which is court proceedings in the United Kingdom. So it really complicates matters for Kazakhstan. And uh, from your uh, personal point of view, what's your opinion? Why uh, European powers so easy? going on demands from Kazakhstan as concerned to Mr. Abliazov and his uh, team. Well, we don't see, uh, obviously, such a situation in Ukrainian situation, uh, I mean, in, in times of Yanukovych or Belarusian or Uzbek, as an example. What's well, going on? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and I've been asking myself this question for the last, uh, for the last year. Uh, because we saw in Italy, Kazakhstan was able to corrupt the local officials. We have seen in Spain, Kazakhstan has been able to corrupt the local officials. In France, there were many odd things happening at the court uh, dealing with the extradition request. In Czech Republic, there have been issues of uh, corruption. Uh, and now we have the situation in the United Kingdom. We've seen uh, so many... Uh, proud European countries who pride themselves 
on rule of law and democracy and all of these principles. But exactly as you say, when Kazakhstan comes in, waving around billion-dollar contracts and opportunities, uh, there is incredible pressure on these countries to sacrifice the principles upon which they say their societies are built uh, in order to get a commercial gain or political favor. So uh, this is the, the short answer to your question. Kazakhstan is relatively far away. Uh, Kazakhstan is not in the news very often in uh, Western European countries. Uh, more and more when Kazakhstan is in the news, it's over disastrous things that happen like Jana Ozen massacre or a Kazakh ambassador in Rome grabbing a little girl that's six years old and the wife of Abdiazov and putting them in a private jet. And so the, the news that generally comes from Kazakhstan is embarrassing news uh, for Kazakhstan, but generally Kazakhstan does not make news in Europe. So political leaders are under enormous pressure from um, uh, large European industries who uh, have opportunities in Kazakhstan, whether it's uh, oil or uranium, um, uh, it could be military related. There are a number of opportunities that Kazakhstan can offer. And uh, it's easy for the politicians in Europe to um, allow themselves to be influenced because they hope they can get away with um, making decisions that they should not make just because people are not looking, people are not watching. Well, Peter, thank you very much for this uh, interview. I hope uh, you will be uh, succeeded in your attempts and uh, we will be in touch.